Chapter 4 of The Life of Benjamin Franklin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Life of Benjamin Franklin by Samuel G. Goodrich. Chapter 4. Finds his friend Collins in New York. Visit to the Governor. Promises from Governor Keith. Project of a new religious sect. Anecdote of Keimer and the Roast Pig. His principal acquaintance. A literary trick. Prepares to go to London. The Governor's deception. Arrival in London. At New York, Franklin found his friend Collins, who had arrived there some time before him. They had been intimate from childhood, and he had been sober and industrious. But during Franklin's absence in Philadelphia, Collins had fallen into bad habits and become a drunkard. He gamed and lost his money, and borrowed of his friend to pay his expenses on the road. The governor of New York, hearing from the captain that one of his passengers had a great many books on board, requested that he might be brought to see him. Franklin, accordingly, waited upon him. He was received with great civility. The governor showed him his library, which was a considerable one, and they had a good deal of conversation about books and authors. This attention was very pleasing to Franklin. When they arrived at Philadelphia, Collins continued to drink and was, consequently, unable to procure any business. He continued to borrow money of Franklin, and finally quarreled with him, and went to the West Indies. Franklin never heard of him afterwards. Sir William Keith received the young printer on his return with a great show of kindness and large promises. "'Since your father will not set you up,' he said to him, "'I will do it myself.' Give me a list of the things necessary to be had from England, and I will send for them. You shall repay me when you are able. I am resolved to have a good printer here, and I am sure you must succeed. This was spoken with an air of perfect sincerity, and Franklin had not the least doubt that he meant what he said. He accordingly made a list of all the articles that would be wanted for a printing house, the cost of which was about one hundred pounds. The governor liked it, and asked whether it would not be well for him to go to England himself, in order to select the types, and see that everything was of the best kind. When there, he added, you may make acquaintance and establish correspondence in the book-selling and stationary way. Franklin thought that it might be advantageous. Then, he said, get yourself ready to go in the Anis, which was the annual ship, and at that time the only one passing between London and Philadelphia. But, as it would be some months before the Annis sailed, Franklin continued to work with Keimer. They agreed together very well, and lived on quite a familiar footing. Franklin used sometimes to argue with his master, and would most frequently beat him. This gave him so great an idea of Franklin's ability in disputation, that he proposed to him to become his assistant in a new religious sect, which he proposed to establish. One was to preach the doctrines, and the other to confound all opponents. When they came to explain with each other upon their doctrines, Keimer was desirous of introducing certain customs which did not entirely meet the wishes of his colleague. Among other things, he wore his beard at full length, because somewhere in the Mosaic law it is said, Thou shalt not mar the corners of thy beard. He likewise kept the seventh-day Sabbath, instead of the first, and both of these points he considered essential. Franklin disliked both, but agreed to them on condition of his adopting the doctrine not to use animal food. Keimer was a great eater, and was not much pleased with the idea of being starved, but he consented to try the practice a few weeks, and see how it agreed with his constitution. They held to this plan for three months. Their provisions were purchased, cooked, and brought to them regularly by a woman in the neighborhood, who prepared, at different times, forty dishes, in which there were neither fish, flesh, nor fowl. Franklin went on well enough, but poor Keimer suffered grievously, grew tired of the project, and ordered a roast pig. He invited some friends to dine with him upon the occasion, but the pig, being brought too soon upon the table, he could not resist the temptation, but ate the whole before his company came. During this time, Franklin had contracted an affection for Miss Reed, and believed that she was not altogether indifferent in her feelings toward him. And as he was about to take a long voyage, however, and as they were both very young, 
her mother thought it most prudent to defer the matter till his return from England. His chief acquaintances at this period were Charles Osborne, Joseph Watson, and James Ralph, all lovers of reading. In one of their meetings it was proposed that at a certain time each of them should produce a piece of his own composition, in order to improve by mutual observations and corrections. They agreed that this task should be to turn the eighteenth psalm into verse. When the time of the meeting drew nigh, Ralph called upon Franklin, and told him that his piece was ready. Now, said he, Osborne never will allow the least merit in any thing of mine, but makes a thousand criticisms out of mere envy. I wish, therefore, you would take this piece and produce it as yours. We shall then hear what he will say to it. It was agreed. At the meeting, Watson's performance was read first. There were some beauties in it and many defects. Osborne's piece was then read, and was much better. Ralph had nothing to produce. It was now Franklin's turn. He was backward, wished to be excused, but no excuse would be received. The piece he brought with him was read and repeated. Osborne was delighted with it, and praised it in the highest terms. As he was returning home with Ralph, he expressed himself still more strongly. Who would have imagined, said he, that Franklin was capable of such a performance? Such painting, such force, such fire! He has even improved on the original. In common conversation, he seems to have no choice of words. He hesitates and blunders, and yet how he writes. When they next met, the trick was discovered, and Osborne was laughed at for praising Ralph by mistake. The governor sent for Franklin frequently to his house, and always spoke of setting him up in business as a settled thing. He was to be furnished with letters to the governor's friends in England, and with an order for the money to purchase a press, types, and paper. For these letters he was to call at a certain time, when they would be ready. They were delayed, however, again and again, till the ship was on the point of sailing. When Franklin went to take leave and receive the letters, the secretary came out and said that the governor was very busy on business of importance, but that he would send the letters on board, wishing him a good voyage and a speedy return. Understanding that dispatches had been brought on board from the governor, Franklin asked the captain for the letters that were to be under his care. The captain told him that they had all been put into the bag together, and he could not then come at them, but that before they landed in England he should have an opportunity of picking them out. This satisfied him for the present, and he thought nothing more of it during the voyage. When they arrived in the channel, the captain kept his word, and permitted him to examine the bag for the governor's letters. He found some upon which his name was put, and picked out six or seven, which he thought might be the promised letters. One of these was addressed to Basket, the king's printer, and another to some stationer. They reached London on the 24th of December, 1724. Franklin waited upon the stationer, who came first in his way, and delivered the letter as from Governor Keith. "'I don't know such a person,' said he, but opening the letter, "'Oh, this is from Riddlesden. I have lately found him to be a complete rascal, and I will have nothing to do with him, nor receive any letters from him.' Returning the letter, he turned upon his heel, and went to wait upon some customer. It turned out that the governor had sent no letters by Franklin, but had completely deceived him. With no intention of giving him any assistance, he had blinded him with brilliant promises and false hopes. But Franklin was able to assist himself. He determined to procure employment among the printers in London and acquire a thorough knowledge of his profession before he returned to America. End of chapter 4